Yes, I certainly would not be doing these programs without Julianne uh, for any number of reasons, but uh, part of it is getting to use her office because I do not have a computer. I have a very small old fashioned iPad, uh, which won't even let me put most apps on it. <clears throat> uh, so again, thank you, Julianne. And this is uh, truly an exciting day because I just received uh, a uh, press release from the university, a copy, <clears throat> indicating that uh, the Vickers collection is coming to the University of Florida. Uh, this is something I first began work on some 15 years ago when Sam Vickers and I were on the Florida Arts Council together. And for those of you who are not familiar with the collection, there are approximately 1,200 works of art in the collection. Uh, Every one has a Florida connection. Some might surprise you because one is a watercolor by Winslow Homer of a black bass striking a lure down at Homosassa. Um, <clears throat> another quite a large painting um, are by N.C. Wyeth and they were the end papers for that uh, edition of the yearling that, that N.C. Wyeth um, illustrated. Uh, there's also um, Wyeth's son's painting of, uh, I believe, of uh, some vegetation, some Florida vegetation. Uh, the third generation, Jamie, has never done a painting for Sam, but who knows, maybe he will. Um, <clears throat> in any event, uh, this is an extraordinary gift. It will add a whole new dimension to the Harn. And uh, uh, Julianne is going to go over and um, do a GoPro uh, preview of it um, with Mr. Uh, Vickers. I just spoke to him and he said he would be delighted to, to have us do that. So you're going to be among the first to see uh, the Vickers collection. And it is, uh, again, mm -hmm. stupendous. It's just so exciting to have both uh, Dudley Farm designated and to get the Vickers collection in the same year um, almost frightens me, uh, but, uh, but again, uh, very gratifying. So um, <clears throat> we got a bit out of sequence uh, as a result of the inauguration. We postponed that offering. And from the standpoint of uh, a logic of chronology, I had planned to uh, talk about what I'm going to talk about today um, before uh, the presentation on, on Vizcaya and the other uh, properties in, in Dade County. Um, <clears throat> so so uh, again, uh, we need to back up about 20 or 30 years in terms of the overall chronology of the course. Um, <clears throat> and in our first session, Jim Cusick and uh, Neil Ware uh, looked at Payne's Prairie, uh, a vast cultural landscape on our doorstep and its evolution over more than 300 years in time. And then in our second session, I described two nationally significant historic vernacular landscapes located in our own Alachua County, um, <clears throat> Dudley Farm and Marjorie Canan Rawlings uh, Farm, each one uh, now a national historic landmark. Um, since, uh, well, shortly after I, after last week's talk, I, I learned that the Secretary of the Interior had signed the final document for Dudley Farm on January the 13th, uh, which was wonderful because with the change in administration, it takes time and, and delays things. So uh, it's a done deal. We now have two national historic landmarks in Alachua County. But today I want to talk about three historic designed landscapes in Florida, uh, each located, um, excuse me, each created during the late uh, 19th century. Uh, the Thomas Alva Edison Winter Estates and Botanical Garden, uh, 1885, at least that was the beginning. Uh, the Barnacle from 1891 and the Correction Unity Settlement uh, in 1894. Uh, in seeking the earliest designed 
landscapes in Florida, one would most likely uh, turn to St. Augustine as the earliest permanent European settlement in what is today the United States, uh, founded in 1565. Um, in St. Augustine's uh, founder, Spain at that time, uh, spectacular design landscapes had already existed um, since at least the uh, 14th century. Well, let me see if I can figure out how to, how to get the first photo on. Is that already on? This is your cover. So okay, so I need to hit mm -hmm. that. Um, <clears throat> this is uh, uh, a prime example. Uh, this is a part of the Henry Leafy Gardens uh, adjoining the Alhambra in Granada. Um, it's one of the oldest surviving Moorish gardens. Uh, and, and of course, in such gardens, water and fountains are uh, a common theme. Uh, <clears throat> and so again, we might have expected something on a smaller scale uh, in St. Augustine, but St. Augustine had no such gardens. Uh, Pedro Menendez and his soldiers wore out their welcome um, <clears throat> by uh, the local Tamuqua chief, Seloy, within nine months. And he and his uh, forces moved out to Anastasia Island where they built a fortified town. Incidentally, no one has found any trace of it up to this point. Because six years later, they moved back to the mainland, but they uh, settled south of the first encampment, which is where the uh, Fountain of Life, Fountain of Youth uh, Park is. Um, <clears throat> the, um, the town plan itself, uh, which was formalized by Governor Mendez de Conso soon after his arrival in 1597, is itself a National Historic Landmark. That's not often understood. Uh, that the town plan itself is a National Historic Landmark. Uh, <clears throat> but it was uh, uh, laid out in accordance with the law of the Indies, which had been uh, passed by the King of Spain during that short period when uh, uh, Menendez and his forces were out on Anastasia Island. So uh, <clears throat> this uh, new plan, which was mandated for all new settlements in the New World, required that there be an open plaza, and if it was on the water, to be open to the water, um, <clears throat> that a government building uh, be seen from the water, as well as uh, a church or the cathedral. And all of this we see um, in St. Augustine, and again, part of that, that plan. Um, <clears throat> well, for its first 250 years, um, St. Augustine was an impoverished garrison town. There were no fine houses. There were no high style designed landscapes. Uh, there were a succession of wooden forts. And then finally, uh, the construction of the Castillo as we know it today, beginning in uh, 1672, I think, and completed in 1697, just in time for uh, more and the terrible siege of 1702. So <clears throat> uh, really everything that, uh, that we know today as historic fabric other than the Castillo uh, dates from 1702. We refer to the first Spanish period, the second Spanish period, but all of that, even though it's first Spanish period, it, it's post 1702. Well, <clears throat> with um, Spain's session of Florida to England in 1763, this changed. The first British governor, uh, James Grant, persuaded Dr. John Moultrie of Charleston, South Carolina to move to St. Augustine in 1764 uh, to assist in forming the government of East Florida. Uh, and I should say at this point that uh, when the British uh, took over uh, Florida, the Florida from Spain, um, they immediately created two Floridas. And what is sometimes not well known is that 
Uh, there were actually 15 British colonies. There were the original 13, and then with the uh, British action to split Florida, uh, there was a 14th and a 15th British colony. Um, <clears throat> and uh, uh, indeed, that remained true even after the Spanish came back. There were considered to be two separate colonies. So uh, <clears throat> again, Dr. Moultrie was prevailed upon to come down from Charleston uh, as Lieutenant Governor and to assist with setting up um, East Florida. And he and his family lived in a building that many of you are familiar with. It's referred to as the Treasurer's House or the uh, Pena Peck House. Uh, it's located uh, right behind the cathedral. Um, and like uh, so many of the um, Spanish uh, buildings from the post-1702 period, the oldest house is another example. Um, <clears throat> during the Spanish, first Spanish period, these houses were only one story high. The British came in and added a second story, and that's true of both the oldest house and of the Pena Peck house. So the next time you're there and taking a look, you can see the very obvious difference between the two stories. But um, <clears throat> that's the townhouse where Lieutenant Governor Moultrie uh, and his family lived. Um, now, during the 1770s, Moultrie built a plantation house called Bella Vista on some 2,500 acres, four miles south of St. Augustine, on the west bank of the Matanzas River at Moultrie Creek. And this was a very elaborate uh, Georgian Palladian mansion, uh, likely inspired by um, a South Carolina home he knew well. I'm hitting the up. What should I do? Not moving. Technical difficulties. Hang on. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> you look on the right, you see Drayton Hall. Uh, and again, this is a home uh, in which I'm sure Moultrie and his wife and family were welcome. Uh, it's on the Ashley River uh, near Charleston. And um, it's about as Palladian as you can get. Now, the, the flankers were demolished long before the National Trust acquired the property in the 1970s or 80s. But originally, it had uh, hyphens and, and flankers. But if you look at the um, building on the, on the left, uh, and many of you will recognize it if you uh, tuned into my course on Palladian influence. Um, <clears throat> this is one of my favorite uh, Palladian houses, um, which is, um, I'm trying to see my, my notes, the Villa Canaro, which is on the main street of a very small town in Italy. But uh, it clearly was the inspiration for uh, Drayton Hall. And then um, if we uh, look just, oh, I don't know, maybe three miles up the Ashley River, we see uh, the uh, landscape gardens of Middleton Place. Um, unfortunately, all we see is one flanker in terms of the original structure that was there uh, <clears throat> because um, near the end of the Civil War, uh, the Yankees burned the main block and the uh, flanker on the right. Uh, <clears throat> the family then lived and, and as recently as 25 years ago at least, Charles Duell, a direct descendant, was living in the flanker on the left, although he also had a um, historic townhouse in Charleston. But um, <clears throat> this is uh, considered the first designed landscape in the United States. And uh, it, it probably has a, a French influence. 
Um, <clears throat> it's particularly known for the two small bodies of water in front called the butterfly lakes. But um, among other distinctive, distinctive things about Drayton Hall, uh, Andre Michaud introduced the uh, first camellias to the United States here, uh, one of which is still alive after some, uh, what, 350 or 400 years. So um, <clears throat> this property is still in, in private ownership by the Duell family. Um, <clears throat> Drayton Hall, which we just saw uh, a neighbor is uh, now owned and, and interpreted by the National Trust. I think it's jointly owned with the state of uh, South Carolina and uh, the historic Charleston Foundation, but it's certainly uh, managed and interpreted by the National Trust. So again, these are properties that the Moultries knew well. Mrs. Moultrie was English uh, from a very well-to-do family. And, uh, and I understand from my reading, uh, pretty demanding in terms of having a nice place to live. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, this, uh, I should have said Drayton Hall was built between 1747 and 1752. Um, and um, uh, Middleton Place was built in 1755. Uh, <clears throat> well, when England retroceded Florida to Spain in 1783, the Moultrie family's 17 years in Florida abruptly ended. Uh, there were no buyers for English plantations. And so the plantation he had built, the house and pleasure gardens he had built just south of St. Augustine, uh, <clears throat> were eventually burned by Indians who were disgruntled at the change of governments. So um, <clears throat> I don't think anyone has identified um, the Bella Vista. Uh, in any event, it would be totally covered by developments nowadays. Uh, Moultrie's 1784 loyalist property claim described a quote, kitchen garden, 10 acres fenced and laid in pleasure gardens containing a bowling green, laid walks with many trees, olives, dates, oranges, lemons, limes, citrons, figs, chaddock vines, and I cannot find out what a chaddock vine is, so if someone listening in will uh, tell me at the end, I will appreciate it. But chaddock vines, uh, white mulberry, pomegranate, peach, plums, banana, pines, etc a park in good order of about 30 acres. Well, again, sadly, all of this soon disappeared. Uh, and uh, all we have is the written description, but clearly it was a plantation, a, a Palladian um, mansion and plantation that were patterned upon those along the Ashley River. Well, let's fast forward a hundred years to, to Florida and Florida historic design landscapes we can visit today, or at least when the pandemic is over. Uh, the earliest of the three I'll talk about is again, the Thomas Alva Edison's Winter Estates and Botanical Garden in Fort Myers. Now, all three that I'm going to talk about are cited on the basis of the presence of navigable water. Uh, in, Florida, in, in Edison's case, a river, um, Edison first came to his site. Uh, <clears throat> this is an archival photograph, obviously, but he first came to this site in 1885 by the Caloosahatchee River and then built this long dock to improve access across the river's shallows. Inspired by the stands of bamboo he found uh, on the shore of the site, he embarked upon construction of an experimental garden there, uh, extending deep inland over 14 acres, uh, divided um, across its length into two plots uh, by a boulevard lined with uh, 
Cuban royal palms. They were actually transplanted from Cuba. <clears throat> and again, this is something you can experience today. I'm sure many of you have. The, the plot uh, facing the Caloosahatchee uh, has both buildings and gardens that represent transplantation in a very literal sense. The main house was built off site. It was built in Fairfield, Maine. It was constructed in four sections and then shipped to Florida, or several sections, and shipped to Florida on four schooners around Key West and uh, up the West Coast, and then assembled uh, as we see it here today. This, this is what I'm talking about is everything you see with red roofs. Uh, on the left is the Henry Ford uh, winter home. Uh, <clears throat> well, this was not unusual in the 19th century um, in Florida. Uh, it was really common for residences to be um, constructed uh, in the Northeast and then shipped to Florida. Uh, now, there is an unusual example as far as I know, this is unique in Florida. And this is um, <clears throat> Apalachicola's uh, Trinity Episcopal Church. I think it was originally called Christ Church. It's built of white pine. It was cut in upper New York State. Then it was completely assembled with wooden pegs, then disassembled, then shipped by schooner to Apalachicola and reassembled there facing Gory Square. And if you have not visited it, you should. It is really one of Florida's architectural treasures. Um, <clears throat> in the interior, and I don't have a photograph of this, but the uh, interior ceiling has never been repainted in all those years. And it has uh, uh, gold stars scattered around it um, in uh, some rational design, I've forgotten now just what it is. But uh, again, this is a spectacular Greek revival structure, but then Apalachicola is loaded with spectacular Greek revival and later structures. Uh, <clears throat> well, just as Edison's house was transplanted from Maine, many of the landscape plants, in particular the royal palms, arrived as specimens dug in distant forests. And although Edison's landscape appears natural, it is as artful as those created by Capability Brown in England during the 18th century. From the house, one has glimpses of the river or can ponder groupings of specimens nearby. Edison treated plants as accents where the perfume, perfume might be enjoyed through a uh, open bedroom window or a collection of plants might add splashes of color when viewed from a porch. Uh, <clears throat> additional garden drama came from artificial lighting of the garden by electricity. Now in 1885, Edison designed a system of underground uh, electric lines so that unsightly wires were not seen. His switches were waterproof and vaporproof. In 1885, in 1990, when I redid my 1930 house in Golfview, I had underground lines put in and switches, and they were neither waterproof nor vaporproof. So uh, apparently, um, we haven't come a long way in that respect. <clears throat> but aside from aesthetics, this designed landscape is one of the oldest and most significant experimental industrial botanical gardens in the United States. <clears throat> While the experimental garden has a long history, probably best illustrated today by um, the Chelsea uh, Physic Garden in London, uh, like the Chelsea one, and incidentally, I think this, this is a fairly recent photo I made, and I think that's Sir Hans Sloan standing on the pedestal in the background, who was the founder of the garden in the 1600s. 
Uh, <clears throat> but uh, again, this one was clearly aimed at, at medicine and, and um, focused on uh, medicinal and agricultural uh, purposes. Uh, but Edison's experiments with plants such as bamboo were applicable to industry. And his garden is a blend of plants chosen for both scientific study and for beauty. Um, if you visit his um, studio there, in which he worked on inventions when he was in residence, you will see a giant uh, goldenrod plant. Because one of the things he experimented was goldenrod as a source of rubber uh, <clears throat> when uh, uh, World War I um, caused a problem in terms of obtaining that resource. Uh, incidentally, uh, enough of it was turned to rubber to uh, make a set of tires, probably his friend Harvey Firestone did it for him, uh, <clears throat> but it was not really practical. So I think that's the only set of tires that were ever made with golden rod. Um, and as a coda to our look at Edison's designed landscape, we have to look next door at the landscape surrounding the Henry Ford Winter Estate. There we have it. Um, <clears throat> Edison and, and Ford, well, uh, Ford was Edison's former employer. They had been friends for decades and they traveled cross country in a Ford uh, to California together many times. And often they were, joint, were joined by their uh, Adirondacks camps friend, uh, Harvey uh, Firestone and the naturalist John Burroughs. And in 1916, uh, after exploring the Everglades with Edison and Burroughs, Ford decided he needed a Florida residence. Um, <clears throat> and he bought three and a half acres adjoining Edison's estate on the Caloosahatchee. And <clears throat> it included uh, this house, which had been built in 1911 by a New York financier. And the house, uh, sat within a growth of grapefruit, orange, and mango trees. And on the Caloosahatchee side were stands of bamboo and coconut palms, no doubt the product of uh, Edison's cultivation next door. But <clears throat> unlike Edison, Ford does not appear to have been very interested in his landscape in Fort Myers. He believed in simplicity, and he believed the land should be serviceable and functional, kind of like chrysanthemums. Well, the significance of Ford's Florida landscape was his decision to make an automobile entrance the principal one to his winter residence, not the entrance from the Caloosahatchee. And remember that prior to this time, uh, throughout Florida, whether we were talking about the Gulf, the ocean, or a river, uh, <clears throat> facades, front facades were typically oriented toward the water. So this shift in sight, in sight orientation away from water, a shift he was largely responsible for as the man who produced autos affordable by the masses, had a profound effect on Florida landscapes of every description. <clears throat> Ford's Florida State marks the beginning of a new preference for the development of architecture and gardens that turn their principal elevations to the street rather than to the water. Moving along, <clears throat> fewer than 20 miles south of Edison and Ford's winter estates um, near Fort, My which are in Fort Myers, um, in a smaller community called Estero, is found the Correction Unity Settlement. This is the state historic marker for it. Uh, <clears throat> like uh, Edison's uh, estate and others that we're going to look at um, next week and, and the following week, uh, it was carved out of Florida's wilderness. 
It was uh, carved out in 1894, and it was only nine years after Addison's Winter Estate incorporated much of the wilderness found there. But this was a 19th century utopian settlement, and the landscape design focused on geometry. Here's the landscape design. Geometry it was a huge part of the religion, if you will, of this utopian group. This was called New Jerusalem. It was a nine square grid of six square miles and included a system of formal gardens laid out in geometric patterns with buildings in various architectural styles. Three geometric elements in particular, the arc, the cord, and the radius, uh, are found throughout the landscape. And Koreshian belief in the cellular nature of the universe is tangibly represented by the layout of the city in concentric circles, concentric rings, that encircle the center and by the joining of circles and squares which occur at the intersections of the grid. <clears throat> These geometric uh, relationships parallel the growth of the settlement, which reflects cellular growth, the Koreshian model of the universe. The starting point of this new Jerusalem centers on the home grounds, also known as the Koreshian Tropical Botanical Gardens. And we can compare the similarity, let me go back one, we can compare the similarity between Koreshian and Addison's slightly earlier winter estate in terms of um, the existing uh, landscape. And while the creative sources of inspiration are entirely different, at the outset, the gardens of the home grounds were carved from the mangroves and stands of pine trees, saw palmetto, uh, and scrub oaks. And then within this uh, native botanical context, the gardens used exotic materials such as the monkey puzzle tree and eucalyptus. Uh, prominent in the home grounds uh, landscape design are four mounds facing the gardens, rising about three feet above the ground with uh, diameters of 10 feet. Then they have three different levels and uh, important in the Koreshian cosmology. <clears throat> Other examples of the design landscape include sunken gardens and a bamboo landing on the river running through the property. Uh, <clears throat> crushed shell paths throughout the settlement were both functional and aesthetically pleasing. The patterns of the silvery crushed shell paths glowed in the moonlight, and apparently they like to get out a lot at night and enjoy the landscape. The community's <coughs> concrete works collaborated with its sculpture department to produce patterned connected foot bridges as well as all manner of ornamentation, examples here, urns, plaques, medallions, uh, figureheads. Well, the philosophical, religious, and social beliefs of the community shaped the master plan and the gardens. Here I'm showing what is called the art house. This is one of the uh, restored buildings and is at least the last time I was there is full of paintings. They were heavily into art and music, um, painting and, and, and uh, themselves uh, playing uh, the instruments. Um, I'm not sure how they ever got any work done. They were so heavily into the arts here, as a matter of fact. But from the community's peak population of 200 in 1908, it dwindled to a solitary few uh, 50 years later and in 1961, uh, the Koreshian Unity uh, Board gave the site, um, which by now was reduced to, or by then was reduced to 300 acres, 
to the state of Florida Department of Natural Resources, which maintains the site as a state park today. Um, there's ongoing restoration of 10 acres forming the original home grounds. Uh, <clears throat> this is undertaken by the citizen support organization. Uh, and in fact, some of the members are descendants of the settlement's um, original founders. Uh, indeed, one of them uh, is a past president of the Florida Trust for Historic Preservation. <clears throat> well, our last stop uh, today is to the Barnacle. Uh, it's also a state historic park. Uh, it's located in Coconut Grove on the oilitic limestone ridge overlooking Biscayne Bay. <clears throat> the um, path leading from the parking area uh, down to the house itself and the, the open area um, <clears throat> is um, kept uh, natural in part to shield modern development to the left of us. Uh, there are actually low rise condos uh, which are very close to the property line. But again, this is uh, an extremely valuable piece of property. Um, and um, it was the, the house itself was built by Rap Middleton Monroe in 1891. He was a boat builder. And of course, this boathouse on the right uh, <clears throat> is where he constructed the boats. Um, <clears throat> And I, I would say that um, this house, I would say there's no other structure along with its landscape in all of South Florida, which better responds um, to uh, early attempts to live in a tropical landscape. Um, although physically, it's only a short distance south of the Scalia the magnificent Italianate creation of James Deering completed in 1916. <clears throat> Having just experienced that uh, with Richard, you can tell that this house is a world away in spirit. And <clears throat> at the time he built it, uh, it was almost impossible to reach it by land. So uh, uh, the water, this Cane Bay was everything. And as an aside, in the early 1980s, at a time when I was president of the Florida Trust for Historic Preservation, I was invited by the Florida Department of Tourism uh, to join a dog and pony show aimed at uh, travel agents in the Washington, D.C. area. And it was the first time uh, nonprofit historic Florida sites had been invited to participate. And <clears throat> Each participant was allowed three minutes to show slides and make comments. Uh, <clears throat> so in deciding what to do and to show in terms of all historic Florida, I chose to feature the Skaya and the Barnacle, a combo I still recommend. Again, they're very close together. They are um, spiritually a world apart. Both are open to the public. Um, and again, Vizcaya uh, uh, actually owned by the state of Florida, but managed by Dade County. Um, the Barnacle, a state historic site. Um, <clears throat> like uh, Spanish built houses in St. Augustine, which were constructed after the devastation of the 1702 siege, when only the fort constructed of Coquina uh, survived the fires. And before the British assumed rule and residence in 1763, the so-called St. Augustine Plan um, responded to the challenges of Florida's Northeast uh, coastal climate with special features. For example, no fenestration on the Northern Wall, uh, the Northern Wall built to the property line, uh, the uh, piazzas on the South, which uh, with the sun high in the summer provided shade and outdoor living, but in the winter when the sun was low to the south, um, provided sun for uh, sitting outside. So that was uh, Northeast Florida's response to the climate. 
Well, <clears throat> this was Monroe's response to South Florida's climate. And the house is a superb example. Uh, this is the view from the balcony uh, looking toward the bay. Uh, again, the house is, is just a great example of local vernacular architecture. Deep porches, uh, hipped roof, and wood frame construction. <clears throat> and interestingly, uh, this originally uh, was a one-story house, but uh, perhaps with the expansion of family, I'm not sure about that, but I do know that the ground floor was raised in the air long enough to construct a new ground floor. And so we're seeing the original ground floor as the second floor there. Uh, the other thing I would point out, if you look at the very top of the hip roof, uh, that's actually a, a, an air vent. And so the hot air, uh, a chimney effect, the hot air was brought up. Uh, and on that, that second floor there, there is an opening, it's sort of a balcony overlooking the later uh, first floor. And so the hot air was, was vented through what we see on top. So again, it was very much designed for the climate. I, I remember the first time I was there, which must have been in the 1970s. And I thought, this is a house I could happily live in right now. I love that house. I could never envision myself living at Vizcaya, but I could have lived at the Barnacle. Uh, <clears throat> well, uh, originally, uh, <clears throat> the um, area was cleared to the water. Again, the, behind it, the sides were left uh, hammock. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, uh, the orientation is, is, of course, toward the bay. That's the primary point of entry. Uh, roads and bridges had not yet penetrated the dense hammock. Uh, and uh, this was not a large property to begin with. I think Monroe had five acres. And really, the bay was Coconut Grove's most important public space. It was the great piazza, but it was a piazza of water. <clears throat> well, uh, the uh, cleared land in front of the house was then dotted with palms and fruit trees and the mangroves, as we saw a moment ago, I think, go back. Uh, the mangroves that were blocking the view and the, the breezes from the house uh, were removed by Monroe, uh, something that would probably be illegal today. <clears throat> so visiting the barnacle today still conveys uh, something of the original context within which Monroe designed this landscape. And still today, a reserve of uh, hammock buffers the site from the intensive development along parts of the barnacles uh, perimeter. Well, that's all I have to say today. So I'm letting you off early unless you have some questions. Any questions? No questions. Well, thank you for being with me for the late 20th, uh, late 19th century Florida visit. And next week, we're going to visit uh, what I think is a unique Florida creation, Bonnet House in Fort Lauderdale, the creation by truly eccentric artists with lots of money. So thank you. <clears throat> thank you everyone for being with us. Thank you, Roy and Julianne. Question. I have a question for you. Okay. Uh, 